Okay, as Puya said, uh, this is some work that, that Burgess and Nipel did uh, for the Ohio Department of Transportation. And uh, this originated because ODOT was having some problems with, with their skewed bridges. And uh, this focuses mainly on steel eye girders because that's, that's where most of the problems were. And, but although it does focus on steel eye girders, a lot of these principles apply to, to any type, type of skewed bridge. The problems ODOT was experiencing was, was mostly, they were mostly related to deck pours. And what they were finding was that the deflections predicted in the plans were often wrong and they led to in, incorrect screed elevations, which in turn led to poor finishes and, and inconsistent thicknesses in the decks. Another problem that arose was the was twisting of the girders, and they were experiencing excessive twist, in, in, especially in heavily skewed structures. And this in one case led to replacement of structure after only a few years of service. So the, the questions that they wanted us to address so why is this happening? What kind of analysis methods can we use to, to predict this behavior? And how can we prevent this from happening in the future? So the, the first portion of the presentation will be an overview of, of how skewed bridges behave. And the first bullet here is a, is a basic statement about skewed bridges. That Introducing skew into a structure produces effects that can't be predicted using line girder analysis. And what I mean by line girder analysis is just a single, a single girder, looking at a single girder at a time without considering the effects of the cross frames. So with a straight, non-skewed bridge, you can generally look at a single girder line and get a pretty accurate picture of how the bridge is going to behave. And this is commonly how simple bridges are designed. But in a skewed structure, the girders interact with each other and distort the behavior of the individual girders. And, and that needs to be taken into account in many cases. And I also refer here to the AASHTO NSBA guidelines for the design for constructability, which is a great source for discussion of, the, of this material on skewed behavior. And it, it divides the behavior into two separate categories, which is intermediate cross frame effects and end cross frame effects. We'll discuss both those in turn. So starting off with the intermediate cross frame effects, uh, this is a, a test case we use to illustrate what those are. This is a simple span structure with a 150 foot span and a 60 degree skew. And there are five girder lines spaced at nine foot six on center. And you note that the intermediate cross frames are perpendicular to the girders and the end cross frames are skewed, which is the typical configuration for this kind of bridge. And we'll start off by looking at the, the structure ignoring the cross frame effects. So if we look at each girder individually, load it, we're looking at, at the deflections during the deck pour. We load it with the deck weight and look how they deflect. What we have is, is a uniform loading on the interior girders and slightly lower loading on the exteriors due to the, the overhangs being slightly shorter than the, the interior bays. And we should note about this, the, each of the vertical lines represents a cross frame location. And if you look down each one of these cross frame locations, you see kind of irregular spacing between the, de the deflections of the girders. If you look at that in section, what you see is that the, you get kind of an irregular shape across the width of the structure. The blue numbers on the top are differential deflections between the adjacent girders. The red numbers on the bottom are the girder deflections. And the important point about that irregular shape is that by ignoring the cross frames is that we get a, we get a deflected shape that can't really happen. The cross frames connecting these girders are, are very stiff and they torsionally restrain the girders so that this shape isn't really possible. 
the conclusion that we can draw from this is that we need to consider those cross frames in the analysis. And here's a simple diagram of how the cross frame functions. So if you have differential deflection between adjacent girders and you assume the girders don't twist, you have to assume there's axial deformation in the cross frame members. And it takes a lot of force to deform those members axially. So the resistance to this type of movement is really high. However, if the girders twist, the cross frames don't have to deform. They can just go along for the ride with the girders. And, and torsionally, eye girders are, are very flexible, so they don't put a lot of resistance up to this type of movement. So this is the common behavior that you see in skewed structures and also in curved structures. So going back to the test structure, you can now look at the, a grid analysis of that structure, which considers the cross frame effects. And the deflection patterns look uh, significantly different. If you look down the cross frame lines, you get relatively even spacing between the deflection girders, the, the, the differential deflections between the cross frames. So if we look at that in section, the top we have the, the section with the cross frames effects ignored, the, the line girder model. And below we have the grid model, which considers the cross frame stiffness. And with the line girder model, you can see the abrupt changes. And with the grid model, you get relatively smooth section that makes a lot more sense. So the next several slides are a walkthrough of how a skewed bridge deflects when you consider the effects of the intermediate cross frames. And note, we don't have any in cross frames in this structure yet. We're looking only at the, the inter intermediate cross frames. So starting off here with section AA, you can see girder 4 is very close to its bearing point. Girder 5, we're out in the span. so. Girder 4 is staying up, small deflections. Girder 5 is, is deflecting, so we get a big differential there. We get similar behavior here. We've got Girder 3 at its bearing point, so everything's falling away from 3. Again here, Girder 2 and a Girder 1. So we're leaning away from that support. As we cross out into the span, the structure starts to flatten out. We get near mid-span. It's relatively flat, starting to reverse itself. And when we get to this section, we've got now girder 5 near our bearing point. The structure's falling away from 5, again at 4, and at 3, and at 2. So over the length of that structure, you get a total reversal in the shape so that you have opposing twists at each end of the structure. Now another effect of the intermediate cross frames is a redistribution of loads across the bridge. And the easiest way to see that is to look at the support reactions at each end of the bridge. Um, the reactions for all the bearings are plotted on the chart at the, the bottom of this slide. Um, the rear bearings on the on the left, forward bearings on the right. Uh, the, the the black line is what was predicted using line girder analysis without considering the cross frames. The pink line considers the effects of the cross frames. So you can see with when when the cross frame effects are considered, you get a large peak at the obtuse corner of the framing that, that you miss in a line girder analysis. So it shows that the, that the intermediate cross frames also have a significant effect on moments and shears within those girders as well. Moving on to the effects of the end cross frames, these are entirely independent from the intermediate cross frame effects. And to illustrate how this works, I'm using an example. This is borrowed from a paper by Fred Beckman and Ron Medlock. This is a two girder bridge with end cross frames only. And this is 
just a generic single span bridge and the skewed in cross frames. And here's an isometric view of that bridge showing the in cross frame. Uh, for simplicity, you can idealize that in cross frame as just a pair of rigid links that connect the, the top flange of one girder to the bottom flange of the other girder. And it's uh, we're talking about in cross frame effects. It's important to think about the mechanics of how the girders deflect. And this drawing shows the, the cambered and the deflected position of a single span beam. So the OH variable is the overhang length prior to, de prior to deflection. And the delta is the initial is the, is the initial camber, the deflection of the, or the, the position of the top flange and the initial cambered position. And here the, the left bearing is fixed in this example. So when the girder deflects, it decambers. It makes the bottom flange longer and the top flange shorter. And the important point here is that the, the top flange and the bottom flange move relative to each other when this happens. Here's a plan view showing what happens as the top flange tries to deflect longitudinally relative to the bottom flange. Uh, the bottom flange of girder A is restrained at the fixed bearing, so it can't move. And the top flange of B must move longitudinally as the girder decambers. But since this girder is restrained, it, it can't move straight as shown here. It has to move radially about the, the bearing point of girder A. So it gets pulled over as it moves forward. So the, through this kind of action, the end cross frames cause twist independently of the intermediate cross frames. Here you can see both girders acting simultaneously. And the, the resultant direction of that movement is approximately perpendicular to the to the bearing line for those girders. Here's a comparison of the girder twist calculated for the in cross frames only versus the, the twist calculated for the intermediate cross frames only. And you can see that the magnitude of the twist is about the same for both with the end cross frames are a bit more uniform across the width of the bridge compared to the intermediate. But if you combine those effects, you have end cross frames, intermediate cross frames, and together, the top shows the two effects independently. The blue numbers are the intermediate effects. The red numbers are the, the end effects. The bottom diagram is the combined effects. They're, they're approximately equal. So both the intermediate and the end cross frames produce this twist independent of each other, but they're not additive effects. They both acting together produce about the same amount of twist. So moving on now to the parametric study we did. Um, many of ODOT's problems originated from the analysis methods being used by designers. Um, prior to the change in policy, it was common practice to use Langer analysis for almost all skewed bridge designs. But based on re recent experience and, and based on the, our study of skewed bridge behavior, it was clear that that was not appropriate, at least not for all structures. So the question we were trying to answer is what level of analysis could be used for which structures? And obviously, we could use a detailed finite element analysis for, for every bridge, but that raises the design costs and, and limits the, the number of consultants that are able to do these designs. So ODOT wanted us to do a study of various different types of structures, determine where the line is where you need to start using advanced analysis methods. 
So for the, the we did uh, different combinations of line gridder only, uh, 2D grid, which is basically all beam elements, which is what MDX and Deskus software, which are the common prepackaged softwares to do grid analysis used by most of, most of the consultants in Ohio are used, and then also a, uh, a couple different levels of, of higher level analysis, a 2D grid using truss cross frames, so modeling the depth of the cross frames and all the members, and then a full 3D finite element with, uh, with plate elements. And we initially did these models, it's done a few years ago in STAD, we've since upgraded those to MIDAS. Uh, MIDAS provides a lot more powerful tools for us to use as far as staging and, and processing the results. It's uh, been very helpful. Uh, this is a basic explanation of the model types we used. A line girder, as I stated before, is, is, is just a simple single girder beam element model. And then the, the 2D grid, this is as modeled using MDX or Deskus, uses beam elements to, to model the cross frames. And it should be noted that, that this model is approximate because you can't fully model the, the cross frame behavior with a single beam element. Both both of those two programs, you do it slightly differently. Uh, for the advanced models, uh, we used uh, an advanced grid analysis with individual cross frame elements modeled for the truss elements, modeled with truss elements, and a uh, a 3D finite element model. We used shell elements for the webs and the flanges, and uh, truss elements for the cross frames. And obviously, as the, as the precision of these models improves, as they become more complex, but data processing for design also becomes a lot more time intensive as the model gets more complex. So we made some pretty straightforward conclusions from this study. And I'll walk through the important ones here briefly. Um, as expected, there's, there's a significant difference between the results obtained between the Langer model and any model including cross frame effects. But in general, Langer analysis was conservative for the calculation of moments and shears because of the distributing effects of the cross frames lowered the, generally lowered the, the moments and shears on the individual girders. And we, only with the structures with a 60 degree skew did we have moments and shears exceeding those predicted by the Langer models. Here we're going to, we're comparing the results of the the basic 2D grid using MDX or Deskus with a higher level model, MSTAT or MIDAS, where truss element cross frames were used. Uh, for the structures examined, these two methods produced very similar results in terms of moments and shears. So the conclusion here is for a simple skewed structure, and these are all very simple structures, just single span, constant skew, a basic, basic grid analysis is, is accurate enough to predict the moments and shears. But I want to make clear that the intent here is not to dissuade designers from using higher levels of analysis. It's, it's just to, and it's recommended that you use those levels for, for more complex structures with variable skews or, or partial length girders. But ODOT's goal here was to set a minimum required analysis level, and for a basic structure, a grid showed itself to be sufficient. And the final comparison here was between a 2D and a 3D model. And again here, for simple structures, there's little difference between the calculated moments and shears. But 3D has a number of advantages in that it's it's required to accurately calculate the lateral bending or, the, or the, the warping stresses in the girder flanges, which can be significant when you have a heavily skewed structure. And there, there, there are more factors than skews that should be considered when you're selecting an analysis method for, for a structure.
So a little discussion of detailing methods here. And, um, in a skewed structure, the girder can be plumb only under a single loading conditions. Um, which loading condition this is depends on the detailing of the cross frames. The method that had been commonly used in Ohio was steel dead load fit, meaning that the, the girders are erected under steel weight only in a plumb position. So when the, when the girders are erected, the cross frames are installed prior to the deck pour, everything is plumb. And then when the deck pour happens, the girders are loaded, the girders go out of plumb. And the, the outstanding question is, I know not to mind anyway, was how, how much twist is acceptable in that method? When does it become a problem? Uh, an alternative method is to use full dead load fit. Here the girders are, are out of plumb when they are erected, meaning that the cross frames are sized to fit in the finished condition rather than in the erected position. So the girders have to be forced into position when the cross frames are installed. They're, they're forced into a twisted orientation. Then if everything deflects as predicted, when the load is added, the girders will then rotate to plumb in the finished structure. And this is the method that's generally recommended by industry experts for detailing a skewed structure. But ODOT has made the decision that they're not comfortable with this method of erecting the beams. They, they feel this contradicts too much of their past practice, which is they prefer to erect the girders plumb and then they're going to limit the twist in the design stage. Uh, third method that we looked into in this study, which is, is lean on bracing. And in extreme cases where twist can't be controlled otherwise, you can you can use an alternative lateral bracing system to control the twist. Since cross frames are the source of the twist, eliminating some of the cross frames can reduce the twist. So in this configuration, some of the cross frames are replaced with top and bottom struts only so that they'll restrain the girders laterally but not torsionally. And these braces allow differential deflection to occur without inducing twist in the girders. So there are a couple different ways you can you can use lean on bracing. Uh, we termed them internal and external. An internal system you have cross frames within the, the loaded portion of the bridge. So here we have deck being applied to this system of girders. We have a cross frame and then we have a series of lean on braces. Um, when the when the system deflects you will get some twist in this section in this system. Um, but you can limit it by carefully placing the cross frames in, in places where there is not a lot of differential deflection. And it does require refined analysis to predict forces and deflections of this system. Here's uh, an example of a framing plan for a, an internal lean on system. Uh, there has to be at least one cross frame in each each line of braces to ensure that it's stable. And the designer does need to do calculations to ensure that you've got enough strength and, um, and enough stiffness to adequately brace all those girders. A uh, second form of the lean-on system is to use an external lean-on system. And in this case, you do not have an, any cross frames within the loaded portion of the bridge. You're braced to an external point the way this has been used previously is with stage construction. You brace to another portion of the bridge that's not, not going to have the deck loaded on it. So that when this portion deflects, there's, there's no cross frames to torsionally restrain the girders. They can go straight down and they all stay plumb, ideally. Uh, moving on, the, 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 the final question that ODOT wanted answered as part of this study is, can we predict twist without going to a grid analysis? Can we do it from line results only? And we, uh, 
devised a method to do this just based on measuring the differential deflections between adjacent girders using a line girder analysis. And uh, came up with a rule of thumb that we found to be conservative up to a 45 degree skew. If you measure the differential deflections, um, this is based on a 1 8 inch per foot of web depth as, as an allowable tolerance for rotation. That comes from the erection tolerance from the um, ASTRO NSBA erection guide specification. So if we go from that tolerance and assume that the two girders rotate as a unit, you can derive a, a relationship of a deflection equal to the girder spacing divided by 100 approximately corresponds to that 1 8 inch per foot. So the rule of thumb established was if your differential deflections are less than curve spacing divided by 100, then twist will be within tolerance. So moving on to the, the policy itself, it's laid out here in flowchart form. And I'll start with, the, with an explanation. ODOT's philosophy on skew is that for a long time they designed skewed bridges using line girder analysis and had no problems. But as codes changed, higher strength steel came into being, and structures got more flexible, they started to have problems. So their general preference is stick the line girder analysis wherever possible, keep it simple, and try to solve the problems by stiffening the girders first. And that creates, a, in their opinion, creates a more durable structure over the long term. So in general, they prefer to spend their money on more steel rather than more analysis. And then as, as people who analyze bridges for a living, we may not necessarily agree with that decision, but it, it does have merits in their opinion. So that, that said, this is the policy. Start of, for skews less than 30 degrees, you're exempt from the policy and line girder analysis is acceptable. For skews from 30 to 45 degrees, you start the process on the left side of this flowchart, which will, and, the, and for skews greater than 45, you start on the right side and then we'll walk through the, each of those in turn here. So for SKUs from 30 to 45, you know, the first step is to perform line girder analysis and use the yes over 100 rule of thumb. If you meet that requirement, you're, you're okay and you can proceed designing the bridge using line girder analysis. Um, you'll notice all, well, as we go through this, all these paths end with confirm that the design rates using PC bars, which is the load rating program that ODOT was using at the time. And the, the point here is that they've had some problems with that in the past and they want to continually design, remind designers that whatever they do, they have to come up with a working load rating when they're done with their design. So if you don't meet the S over 100 requirement, the policy then kicks you over to stiffen your design. What they mean by stiffen is incre increase plate sizes, web depth, or that whatever you can do under the constraints you're operating under, up to 25% of the weight of the girder in an effort to reduce those deflections. If you're successful, you use the stiffened girder and proceed with line girder analysis. Design the bridge that way. If you are not successful, you're then forced to perform a refinement analysis. And what they mean by refined analysis is any form of analysis that acknowledges the cross frames. So at a minimum, a grid analysis. But that's, that's at the designer's discretion. And once you go to grid analysis, the criteria changes to twist, which can be taken directly from the analysis results. So you check for less than 1 inch per foot. You then kick back into the stiffen and the design option if you can get that to work. This is not, it doesn't mean stiffen it twice. It, it assumes you've gone back to the original optimized design for the grid analysis. So you can then stiffen above 25% relative to the optimal design and attempt to meet that eighth inch per foot. If you still cannot need to meet it, they recommend then you go to an internal lean-on system. 
then if you still cannot meet it, they recommend going to an external lean on system. Now, by the time you've reached this point, it's probably time to reevaluate your design beyond just an external lean on system because the application of external lean on is kind of site specific and, and may not necessarily make any sense for, for a given bridge. But the point being, once you reach this stage, you need to start looking at alternatives to, to conventional erection because you're going to have a large twist problem. So now going back and starting on the structures greater, with a greater than 45 degrees skew, it's essentially the same policy. You just skip all the Langerer analysis. You go straight to the refined analysis and uh, measure twist directly and then follow the same path. So that's the analysis policy uh, related to end cross frame conditions. Um, for skews greater than 30 degrees, ODOT recommends that you not put in the end cross frame diagonals at the time of the deck placement. And its uh, designers should note that this creates a, a temporary stability problem during the deck pour, which you usually need to deal with with external braces of some sort. But it, it does end up in, does eliminate a lot of potential problems with those end cross frames. They beyond the twist, they also produce a lot of lateral force, which can shear off anchor bolts, that sort of thing, at the end of the bridge. And then I'm going to talk briefly about how Midas Civil can be used as a tool in the analysis of skewed bridges. Um, <clears throat> one of the very useful features is, is stage construction analysis. So if you want to consider a multiple stage deck pour, uh, you can apply load in different stages and, and let's see, this slide, okay, there we go. You can apply load stage by stage and look at deflections during each stage. Um, you, the, the most accurate model, is, as we talked about, is to use, use shell elements for the webs, and then you can, you can either use shell or beam elements for the flanges. Both produce good results, and you can get a very good representation of the behavior of the girders. So a multiple stage analysis of a skewed bridge might look like, like this. Um, have a stage for the self-weight of the girders. You can apply scaffolding loads uh, using a couple between the, stange, the, between the flanges, which will also produce twist in those exterior beams. And then each stage of the deck pour can be added using a, a different construction stage. So here you see the deflect, deflection due to stage one deck pour. And you can see the deformed shape that we talked about earlier, uh, with each end of the bridge twisting in opposing directions. And one of the advantages here of using beam elements for the flanges is that you can directly extract the lateral bending stresses from those flanges. Um, from the beam elements used to model those front flanges. And this is something that can't be calculated in a, in a 2D model with straight beam elements, since the warping stiffness of the girders isn't included in those models. <clears throat> 